Welcome to my channel. Today, I will share with you Jim's story. His wife cheated on him. Please subscribe to our channel, and we will begin the narration. My name is Jim, and today marks the third anniversary of my marriage to my wife, Deborah. I had prepared a candle at dinner for her, but all the candles have burned out, and she still hasn't returned home, making me anxious. Deborah used to be different. While not the perfect wife, she was gentle and obedient. However, lately, she has been acting strangely. She comes home drunk every day, and on some occasions, she even stays out all night. Whenever I ask her, she brushes it off as work-related stress. I had planned on having a heartfelt conversation with her on our anniversary, but she has yet to return home even at this late hour. Deborah and I met in college. She was the belle of the economics department, with countless admirers due to her fair and beautiful appearance. Despite numerous suitors, she chose me amidst my fervent pursuit and romantic gestures. After a long-distance relationship in college, we graduated, got married, and started our respective careers. I landed a job as a programmer at a gaming company, while Deborah, through a friend's referral, became an accountant at a large corporation. Our life, though not affluent, was filled with happiness and sweetness, except for one thing, Deborah's gambling habit. I was aware of it but did not stop her, letting her enjoy her pastime as long as it didn't affect our family or work. As I reminisced about our past, I took out my phone to call Deborah. Just then, I heard the sound of keys unlocking the door, and in walked my wife, reeking of alcohol. She had been drinking again, surprised and filled with inexplicable anger, I stood up intending to confront her. But before I could speak, Deborah headed straight to the bathroom and started vomiting. Despite her condition, I felt a pang of sympathy and picked up some tissues to hand to her for wiping. However, as I entered the bathroom, a strange odor hit me. Apart from the mixture of alcohol and food scent, there was a foul smell of mud or seawater, making it unbearable. At that moment, Deborah stood up, her gaze unfocused. She staggered towards me and collapsed into my arms. Shaking off my initial shock, I asked sternly, Have you been drinking? The stench grew stronger with Deborah's response. Yes. It was a company dinner tonight. I said my husband was waiting at home. Deborah mumbled incoherently. Lost in thought, my hands began to move uncontrollably, caressing my wife's body. However, a disturbing sight caught my eye a bruise under her fair skin near the lovely lace neckline. What happened here? I pointed at the bruise on her collarbone and demanded, Do you even care about this family anymore? Deborah appeared unstable grasping onto my arm for support as she lowered her head, seemingly hesitant to explain. Fueled by anger, I advanced, grabbing her clothes tightly. I was stunned by Deborah's resistance to my actions. She frantically waved her hands, trying to ward off my aggression, muttering, Honey, please, please don't. However, as a fragile woman, especially while intoxicated, she couldn't possibly be a match for me in strength. The sound of fabric tearing filled the air. In an instant, I was left dumbfounded, as I had forcibly removed Deborah's outer garment to reveal that she was wearing lingerie underneath. Perhaps due to my forceful actions, her lingerie was torn halfway apart. My wife, once regarded as the pure goddess by many in our college days, had worn lingerie to work without my knowledge. The anger building inside me nearly drove me to madness. How could you do this? I demanded. Deborah, struggling and crying, pleaded, Honey, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's not what you think. She reached out and grabbed my arm, but at that moment, she had lost my trust. I decided to get the keys from the coffee table and leave our once cozy room. However, to my dismay, Deborah followed me into the living room and suddenly threw herself onto me, holding me tightly. 
Looking at the tears on Deborah's face and considering the possibility of her betrayal, my anger reached boiling point. Fury surged through me, and I pushed her down onto the sofa, pinning her hands down, roaring, Today is our wedding anniversary, don't you know that? Do you crave other men so badly that you have to sneak around behind my back, honey, I really didn't? Deborah sobbed as she pleaded with me, but I was no longer able to listen to her words. I just drank too much and forgot how I got hurt, she gasped, appearing like a frightened and helpless little rabbit. This attire of mine. Despite her trembling upper body. Deborah hastily explained, ripping off her lingerie in a panic, today is our anniversary, and I didn't forget. This was meant as a surprise for you when I got home. But due to a last-minute office dinner, I ran out of time, please, honey, trust me, she pleaded, looking at me with tear-filled eyes, appearing so pitiful. Our mutual friend is at a gathering, the one you know. If you don't trust me, call her, she said, handing me her phone. Honey, please don't leave, I really love you, she pleaded. Despite our years of marriage, seeing her like that, I softened a bit. In the end, I didn't call her sister for confirmation, but that didn't mean I believed her words. Marriage involves many complexities, and I planned to discreetly investigate what she had been up to. If she was truly having an affair, I wouldn't spare her. I firmly believe that infidelity happens once or multiple times, and if she was truly unfaithful, she wouldn't be able to resist. However, to my surprise, I quickly found evidence of my wife's infidelity. It was a weekend when I returned home to find my wife home early from work. Deborah was busy in the bedroom, her phone left on the table. Just as I was about to change my shoes, her phone vibrated, and I instinctively picked it up. It was a text message, Sweetie, meet me at Mountain City Villa later, remember to bring your bird mask. Your husband has a new game in mind, my anger surged, but I silently placed the phone back in its place. This time, I would catch her in the act and see how she would explain herself. As expected. When Deborah emerged, she glanced at me on the sofa before picking up her phone and then glanced at me again. Honey, I have some work stuff to attend to, I'll be out for a bit, she said, scrolling through her phone, showing work-related discussions on the screen. All right, come back soon, I replied casually. As she left, looking through the window, I saw her take a taxi and leave. I then prepared to follow her. Stopping a taxi downstairs, I told the driver, take me to Mountain City Villa, without betraying my emotions. The taxi driver glanced at me through the rearview mirror and asked mockingly, why go to Mountain City Villa? Finding a mistress? Ignoring his remarks, I remained expressionless. Seems like the boss is going to spend some money, he chuckled, making my heart sink further. Moments later, we arrived at Mountain City Villa. I paid the fare and headed towards the entrance. However, I noticed security guards patrolling in the evening sun, with numerous surveillance cameras monitoring the villa. Realizing the difficulty of entering, I had no choice but to lurk nearby, hoping for an opportunity to sneak in. At this moment, a woman wearing bunny ear decorations, dressed in a JK outfit, and with unknown liquid on her face, rushed out of the villa. Hurry, kill me. Kill me, she exclaimed, tears streaming down her face, yet the flushed complexion displayed immense joy. To my astonishment, the woman's smooth exposed skin was riddled with long needles, resembling a porcupine. Which was truly horrifying. This scene instantly reminded me of a horror doll from a movie. Good little bunny, open your mouth, ah. The woman opened her mouth maniacally. I looked at the woman and realized that she was insane. Suddenly, the frantic woman rushed towards the hiding spot where I was. I hesitated, knowing that the man inside the villa shouted angrily, catch that rabbit. Just then, several security guards stormed out of the villa, armed with ropes and batons, aggressively approaching the woman. 
as she dodged and cried, you beasts, worse than animals. Let me go. Let me go. Despite her struggles, her strength was too weak, and finally, the guards subdued her, bound her tightly, and carried her back into the villa. Seizing the chaotic opportunity, I sneaked past the blind spot of the surveillance cameras and entered the villa. Inside the villa, it was eerily quiet, a stark contrast to the chaos outside. Quietly, I made my way to the bathroom, desperately trying to think of a way to rescue my wife. Yes, to rescue her. Witnessing the events at the villa entrance outside, I understood the danger my wife was facing, and from my observation of the crazy woman earlier, it was likely that the women brought to this place were being coerced. Surveying the bathroom, I noticed a window in the center through which I could climb. I intended to prop myself up to assess the outside environment, hoping to find a way to infiltrate the party. However, as I pulled the window open and peered down, I was stunned. The bathroom window faced directly towards the banquet hall. Around a massive dining table, crowded with people, yes, crowded with people. Stacked on top of each other, men and women wore strange masks, while women donned various revealing and provocative outfits, kneeling or kneeling on all fours. My wife, Deborah, beloved as the department flower of the economics department, was being coaxed onto the table by several burly men. She twisted her intricate figure, her mouth subtly exhaling unfamiliar smoke. As my anger and shock flared, I heard footsteps outside the bathroom. Overwhelmed by the chaos, I had forgotten to lock the door, the footsteps drew nearer, approaching the bathroom door rapidly. Without a second thought, I quickly dropped down and hid in a bathroom stall. Click, the door was shut, and I shivered uncontrollably. The footsteps grew closer, my breathing becoming more labored. Just as I was about to bravely investigate, a splash of water was heard from outside the bathroom. I remembered the location of the urinal, which should be facing away from the stall. Suddenly, a bold idea formed in my mind. I hesitated and then burst out of the bathroom, delivering a forceful elbow strike to the back of the man who was urinating. As he collapsed, I dragged him into the stall I had hidden in earlier and used his clothes to jam the door lock. Afterward, I removed his mask and put it on. I had realized the importance of the mask for blending into the party here, recognition was based solely on the mask worn, not on the person underneath. With the mask on, I adopted a confident stance as I stepped out, though my nerves were in turmoil. Unbeknownst to me, a figure appeared before me. It was a maid wearing a dog mask and a maid outfit, wait, a maid? I glanced at her. Her shoulder-length hair, watery eyes, and slender figure exuded elegance. Blushing, she coquettishly said, Master, why have you only just come out? I was taken aback by the situation. In a moment of clarity, I realized that the maid was likely waiting for her masked master. Do you know me? I asked, surprised. She reached out and touched the mask I was wearing and said, Master, always joking. Don't upset the little dog, she said, leading me upstairs. Following her flirtatious demeanor as she swayed up the stairs, overwhelming me. I dared not resist and followed her into a room. As I took in the opulent European-style decor, with a grand French chandelier at the center and exquisite furniture, I was struck dumb by the scene that resembled a fairy tale princess's bedroom. Out of nowhere, the maid turned seductively and entered a dog cage. Yes, a dog cage, a bizarre assortment of items adorned the whimsical interior of the lavishly decorated room. Astonished, I hesitated as the maid grabbed my belt. What was she planning to do? I instinctively seized my belt, stepping back in panic and accidentally bumping into a table. As the table seemed to teeter, I reached out and felt a button underneath. Accompanied by beeping sounds, the door swung open, revealing a waiter-like person entering. 
Hello, sir, service number 087 at your disposal, he said, waving outside. A group of men in black entered the room. Growing nervous, I wondered if they were there to capture me. Attempting to maintain calm, I kept my eyes fixed on the smiling service person, but my body was tense with vigilance. To my relief, the men ignored me and proceeded to open the cage and drag the maid out by her hair, as if she were a lifeless dog. No, please don't, she pleaded. Master, don't abandon me, she cried. Her desperate pleas grew louder, yet I remained composed. The men dragged the maid away, and the service person apologized, I'm sorry, sir, for any dissatisfaction with your experience, this is our menu, please feel free to have another look. I guarantee your satisfaction this time, he said. Handing me a beautifully crafted menu. I struggled to steady my trembling hands as I took the menu from him. Sitting on the plush sofa, I pretended to flip through it, but inside, a storm was raging. The disturbing scene from earlier had left a deep mental impact on me, and the realization that it wasn't a dog but a human being as the victim was still unsettling me. I couldn't fathom the treatment Deborah was subjected to at this place. Even more daunting was the thought of the possible consequences if my identity was exposed. Sir, are you not satisfied? Just as I was lost in my thoughts, the waiter's sudden interruption startled me. I looked up at him, his smile as immovable as a mask, showing no hint of emotion. If you're not satisfied, we have other animals, and of course, you can choose me if you prefer, he said, pointing to himself. As long as you're pleased, how we handle these animals is entirely up to you. His words sent a chill down my spine, but thankfully, my expression was hidden by the mask. At that moment, my eyes caught a familiar name on the menu, Nightingale. I pointed to it. I'll choose this one. Very well, sir, please wait a moment, the waiter replied before leaving the room. Alone in the room, anxiety and fear gripped me, but I soon gathered my resolve. I was determined to confront Deborah and uncover what she had been involved in. If she had been coerced, I would call the authorities without hesitation. Various scenarios flashed through my mind, and just as I prepared mentally, the sound of the door opening interrupted my thoughts. Upon looking up, I was taken aback. Deborah had arrived. For some reason, at the sight of her, I felt an impulse to escape. But it was too late, she was already inside. Deborah stood before me, her face concealed by the nightingale mask, revealing only her captivating eyes and cherry lips. Good evening, sir, Nightingale is at your service, she greeted, lowering her body in a provocative manner accentuating her curves in the lingerie. Trembling, I reached out to take her shoulder, but Deborah skillfully interlocked her fingers with mine. Deborah. My voice trembled. What had led a former top student and my compliant wife to fall into such a depraved situation, who? Husband? Upon hearing my voice, Deborah finally looked up, her eyes betraying deep confusion and fear. Tears welled up in her eyes, leaving me frozen. What kind of play was this? Why are you crying? I asked. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to deceive you, she whimpered, collapsing to the ground as if devoid of strength. I was coerced by the company's top executives to falsify accounts. If I didn't comply, I'd go to jail, she confessed, her voice filled with tears. Why didn't you tell me? We're husband and wife, I questioned her, feeling a mix of disappointment and understanding. My suspicions had turned out to be true Deborah was indeed coerced. I couldn't tell you, I was afraid. Afraid that you would find me filthy, afraid that you wouldn't want me. She trembled, hugging her legs tightly, looking utterly pitiful. Don't be afraid, let's call the police now, I squatted down, comforting Deborah. The police will surely give us justice. With that, I took out my phone. As she stared at my phone in a daze, she instinctively spoke, 
you brought your phone in here? It dawned on me that phones were prohibited for everyone here. It made sense, at a secretive gathering like this, keeping a low profile was key, and bringing a phone would jeopardize one's identity except for an outsider like me. Wait for the police to arrive, and then you can share everything. Everything will be fine, I assured her as I dialed the number. Bang! Deborah knocked my phone away, leaving me bewildered. What are you doing? Honey, my accounts are still in their hands, she pleaded. Ah, there was another layer to this whole situation. You mean the accounts are in this villa? I was taken aback. Deborah suddenly threw herself into my arms, crying and apologizing. Sorry, honey, she sobbed. I didn't want this, but I couldn't let the police find those ledgers. It would all be over for me. She sobbed, clutching my waist. Faced with her desperation, I ultimately placed down my phone. After all, she was the woman I had pursued diligently since our university days and had now become my wife. Don't worry, I'll go and steal the ledgers later and then we'll report them to the police and bring them to justice. As I set aside my phone, Deborah visibly relaxed. Okay, I reluctantly agreed. Thank you, my husband, she said, rising from the floor. As she planned to retrieve the ledgers, she hesitated and ultimately decided to take action after I had accepted her suggestion. Concerned for her safety, I contemplated challenging her decision but decided against it to keep her safe. Just be safe. I'll wait here for you, I reassured her. If things go south, come find me immediately. Understood? I held Deborah's face, emphasizing the importance. Rest assured, I'll be fine, she replied with a determined look. With that, we set an hour as the time limit for Deborah to return to me. The passing moments were excruciating for me, staring blankly at my phone screen. Suddenly, the alarm beeped an hour had passed. However, Deborah had not returned. Anxious, I immediately dialed the emergency services. I heard urgent footsteps outside the door, and my entire being tensed up at the sound. Could it be? Someone has arrived? Instinctively, I looked towards the door behind me, hoping to see Deborah's figure appear. Thoughts flooded my mind, but reality delivered a harsh blow. The person entering was the same waiter from before, followed by those few burly men. As I watched them enter, I quickly silenced my phone and discreetly stowed it in my pocket. You. I began to speak, but as my eyes focused on the person supported by the burly men, a wave of dread washed over me. To my horror, it was the man I had knocked unconscious in the restroom earlier now awakening and leading a group to capture me. As I hesitated, the men closed in, and the man in the middle pointed at me, commanding, that's the one, grab him. Despite my struggles, I was swiftly bound by the men and dragged into what appeared to be a kitchen area. Head chef, we've got him. They tossed me to the ground and pinned me down. Looking around, I saw chefs in white uniforms surrounding me. Their conversation, muffled to my ears, finally revealed a central figure. My wife! I exclaimed. Deborah appeared, almost collapsing, her eyes glazed over, saliva trickling from her mouth. Inexplicably, the woman I had seen earlier outside the villa flashed in my mind. Oh, a stroke of good fortune. A rugged voice said beside me, the so-called head chef. To see a couple commit a crime together, that's what I enjoy most. His voice dripped with lecherous and sinister glee. Meanwhile, he appeared to sense something itching, so he loosened his chef's apron. Oh, yes. The others echoed in agreement. I knew it, Deborah and I were done for. Lift his head, the head chef commanded the staff, and suddenly, I felt my head being forced upwards directly facing Deborah. Do you know what drug your wife has taken? 
The chef's excitement was palpable as he spoke. I remained silent, locking eyes with him. It's something that will make her very happy, he continued, his excitement evident. Our principle is simple, customer satisfaction is our honor. Since our distinguished guest is here, I must serve him well. Everyone, come over, let him see his wife's true face. The head chef beckoned the kitchen staff over. At his command, the men wearing white chef uniforms advanced towards a frantic and struggling Deborah, lying helplessly on the ground. No! I shouted, my voice almost tearing my vocal cords. With a sudden motion, the head chef forcefully removed Deborah's mask, revealing her flushed and stunningly beautiful face beneath. Clang! The mask was tossed before me. Upon seeing the contents of the mask, my body couldn't help but shudder. The mask was covered in tiny, densely packed words. It detailed Deborah's situation, specifically, her enormous gambling debts. See that? That's your good wife of yours, the head chef taunted. She owes us so much money. She willingly came here to work off her debts as an animal, it wasn't coercion from us, he continued. And she even offered company funds as collateral for her debts. Coming closer, he said to me, thought I'd let you know, your wife's debts were settled long ago. She's a natural at this, willingly staying here. So many clients, not a single complaint, as I stood frozen in place, watching the crowd surrounding Deborah, my heart was in turmoil. Suddenly, the head chef grabbed my hair, delivering a fatal blow. Forgot to mention, your wife's debts were already paid, he sneered. They moved me closer to Deborah. Now, dear guest, enjoy the play your wife has personally rehearsed for you. Ha ha ha. With a sinister laugh, the head chef pulled a disoriented and degraded Deborah to her feet. My heart sank to the depths as I helplessly watched. No! I screamed in fury, frantically trying to break free from their hold. But I was unable to escape. Deborah was about to be violated, and I could do nothing to stop it. Just then, the police arrived, rescuing Deborah and me putting an end to the debauchery. Deborah was saved while I shared with her what I had learned from the head chef. This time, no matter how she might plead, I would not forgive her. Dear, I love you. Please don't leave me, she begged, kneeling as if she were a puppet without strings. Her words, however, repulsed me. I walked out of the hospital room, ending the absurd marriage and my once innocent youth. The police investigation revealed the truth of Deborah's crimes, confirming the head chef's claims. Deborah had amassed huge gambling debts and embezzled funds in a desperate attempt to turn things around, only to end up losing everything. She then resorted to this degrading method to repay her debts, eventually surrendering to her descent into hell. The villa was seized by the police, and all involved were sentenced, including Deborah.